Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here today. My name is Pablo Gonzalo. I am in charge of uh, digital culture uh, here at the foundation. Uh, I am lucky to be here today with, uh, amongst others, uh, Rafael Martinez Cortina, who is uh, essentially many other things. He's part of the scientific uh, commission of the Telus uh, uh, Journal, uh, amongst many other things, of course. And we just wanted to make a um, very brief introduction to this event today. So on my behalf, just uh, thank you for being here today. Tell us, as you very well know, started being a magazine published by uh, the Telefonica Foundation and it's still published by the Telefonica Foundation and it's always been a pioneer and it's always been at the spirit of the ideas that were forming our world and the world that's about to uh, be here with us and we continue uh, walking that path but I believe that tells goes beyond being just a journal it's not just a journal it's uh, a true uh, uh, thinking and, and ecosystem. It's a community in which we can have an open debate about these ideas and we try to have a dialogue with society and all of you. So we believe it's very interesting and, and needed uh, to make sure that future is not something that is just uh, something that's given to us but something that we can be part of and to do that uh, events like the one we're holding today and the ones we're going to be holding all throughout the year and the TELUS forum that lasts for several weeks and takes place every year try to all well, have the same objective in mind. I hope you still uh, follow us not just in this debate but in the many uh, to follow. I just wanted to thank all the people who had made uh, this possible and first Juan Zafra who's the director who's the uh, editor of uh, the TELUS uh, journal and who's one of the uh, people who have uh, made sure that this uh, space is uh, open and vibrant. I want to thank Mr. Rafael Martinez Coutinho as well. He's one of the uh, people who are guilty of uh, having and hosting this event here and uh, as a Tsuko Thurla's way. And, and the, the person who's going to be uh, moderating the debate, uh, Carlos Umaña, and of course our uh, my guest here today, Ms. Setsu Kotherlo, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us so you can share your thoughts and your ideas uh, with all of us. I hope you all enjoy it. And that's all. I'm, now I'm going to give the floor to Rafa. He's going to tell us a bit more about uh, the debate that we're going to have, be having here today. Well, thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Pablo, for hosting this this conversation and you were right the uh, a previous event in tell us in december 2019 and jared diamond mentioned uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons as one of the biggest threats uh, to the evolution of human beings and well he he just put that uh, challenge on the table he he mentioned it and well, we started thinking about it and we we said, well, you know what, he is right. But this is not part of the conversation today. The conversation has so many different topics that nuclear weapons and non-proliferation is not part of the conversation really. And what can we do? We, we thought uh, it was a challenge. What can we do? Well, let's... Uh, encourage the conversation so we can keep on thinking about it so we have invited two great experts so uh, worldwide two huge experts in nuclear weapons they they know about it firsthand today we have the extraordinary opportunity to be able to listen to two people who oh well it, 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 that it's actually a huge honor for us to be able to listen to to their words. So we're going to listen to Carlos Humanian first. He is, well, Carlos, he's the member of uh, the ICANN and vice, uh, regional vice president of the International Association of uh, Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And he was awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 1985. Uh, after Carlos, we're going to have uh, Setsuko Thurlow. 
a survivor of uh, the nuclear bombing in, at uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nobel Peace Prize in 2017, uh, an award and he... Uh, 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 received on behalf of the ICANN, which is the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And after uh, Setsuko's presentation, we will be able to uh, see a human conversation, a spontaneous conversation between two uh, people, two human beings, who are going to uh, reflect upon nuclear weapons. We're going to be able to have that extraordinary uh, experience of listening to a human conversation. So, thank you all for being here, and welcome, Carlos. Oh, I forgot, excuse me, I forgot to mention that after that conversation between Tetsuko and Carlos, all those who are here today can uh, be a part of the conversation because we are going to have a Q&A session. So all of those, all those of you here today are very welcome to this conversation. So let's start the conversation with Carlos. Carlos, thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. It's a huge honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. I want to thank the Telefonica Foundation and my, my friend Rafa Martinez Cortina who's uh, been uh, making sure this happens and it, well to make sure this conversation took place and uh, we and he was also in charge of making sure this uh, audience here supports us uh, to get to Spain support these initiatives of uh, well, against nuclear weapons as Rafa mentioned I am part of the international campaign to abolish the use of nuclear weapons I can we were awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 for two reasons because we raised awareness uh, uh, on the use of nuclear weapons and our revolutionary efforts to uh, achieve a ban on nuclear weapons through a treaty. This is a process that's called humanitarian uh, and we place human beings at the core of all the conversations around these ho horrible uh, weapons and there's a lot to say about these uh, weapons. I am not going to uh, say everything about them but I would like to start by saying that we are facing two uh, uh, th uh, threats for our existence. One's climate change and nuclear weapons. These are weapons that generate a multidimensional devastation. So they not only destroy the area in which uh, they exploded, not only do they uh, kill and injure people, but that area becomes an, uh, an area that cannot be inhabited becomes a nuclear desert. People who suffer uh, the aftermath of nuclear weapons are not only going to suffer then, but they're going to have a horrible suffering all along their lives. Also, their uh, uh, sons and daughters will be suffering about uh, for it, or their offspring, because there's no chance of receiving aid. People are injured, who are injured are going to suffer on their own. And something technological today here in this uh, scenario it's worth mentioning it there's also an, an electromagnetic pulse that can um, uh, kill all the technological devices uh, in, in, a, in a huge area that goes beyond that in which the explosion took place and in this technological era that would be a real disaster but this is not a theoretical risk. The risk of this happening is extremely high. The uh, uh, Journal on uh, Atomic Scientists uh, has a, a, a clock. It's the apocalypse clock that measures uh, the risk of uh, human destruction through nuclear war in minutes before midnight. This year, 2020, that risk is at 100 seconds prior to midnight. That's the highest risk. We, we've, we've had in, in history since that uh, clock started in 1947. And why have we got that huge risk? Well, there are different reasons. First, um, given the uh, extremely hard rhetoric of uh, those uh, governors that have uh, nuclear weapons, climate change that can uh, spark uh, regional 
issues and also given the extremely high uh, pro possibility of having an accidental explosion of a nuclear weapon. There have been over 1,000 issues with nuclear weapons in only in the U.S. And seven of those accidents, uh, seven of those uh, could have caused a worldwide nuclear war. And the dependence on automated systems uh, is of, uh, for these weapons, well, there's an issue to have uh, established that the most probable nuclear war is uh, it's going to be due to an accident. So if we are alive here, it's it's just by luck, not given a new management of these weapons. And we should also understand why these weapons exist. Why we are depending on those nuclear weapons because they're not practical. They cannot be used. They can they're not made to be used uh, with a military target. They are made to to target at cities and kill civilians. And if they are used their use is suicidal. So those are weapons that are, are made not to be used to be um, just a threat, a symbol of threat. And this symbol of threat is uh, nourished by a rhetoric that says that their destructive uh, uh, power generates, uh, generates uh, a prestige, that position. And that's a rhetoric. That's a, that's a speech that has been forced by everybody, by the whole world. And until a few years ago, in July 2017, 122 countries decided, uh, well, signing or passed, sorry, a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, uh, the United Nations. 122 countries is a clear uh, majority of uh, the international community. What does it mean? It means that we are weakening this uh, symbol. Non-nuclear countries are saying it's enough. We are not going to contribute to it, and we are not going to be hostages of this symbol. And that prohibition has actually worked. That prohibition worked with uh, the other uh, mass destruction weapons that were prohibited before, and um, when then uh, get uh, destroyed. We're talking about biological landmines, and that prohibition also worked with slavery. When we uh, when uh, Slavery started being abolished. Uh, slavery was actually an activity that was carried out worldwide, and it was uh, quite a strong activity in international commerce, in international trade. And Spain understood that very well with the referendum that took place in, uh, in 1986 when they wanted to be part of, the, of, the, uh, of NATO. They decided they were going to be part of NATO if uh, nuclear weapons were prohibited in the Spanish territory. And that's where we are at in this uh, humanitarian disarmament. And we are trying to generate this change, making sure that that prestige is not linked to the destructive power, to the threat and, and imposition, but rather to the construction of a dialogue and building breaches and multilateralism. That's the process we are are part of today and it's going to be needed to face climate change as well. Today we have the privilege of uh, having the testimony of a witness of history. Let's hope this uh, witness and, and the testimony of my dear friend will have the privilege of, uh, of calling a friend and it's Etsuko Thurlo. Hope she's able to open our eyes uh, for us to see the threat because her experience could be repeated at a much larger scale. Thank you, and I'm going to give the floor now to Setsuko. Thank you. No. Good evening, everybody. I am very happy to be here. 
and to spend some time with you to talk about something unpleasant, but something we have to talk about, think about, study about, and make some action. Each one of us has to take action about this if we want the future. I, I was born and brought up in the city called Hiroshima, Japan, in 1945, August 6. I was a 13-year-old grade 8 student in junior high school. Uh, Japan was fighting with the United, United States and losing badly. And in those days, we hardly stayed in the classrooms and had the academic subject. We were mobilized to work for the army and city government and so on. And on that very day, August 6, 1945, I happened to be at the army headquarter, which was about 1.8 kilometer or one mile away from um, Hypo Center. That was Monday morning. You see, a group of 30 of us had been chosen and been trained uh, to decode secret messages for the army. Can you imagine 13 year old girls could do such important, highly skillful work? That was Monday morning, 8.15. We just started having morning assembly. The of army officer said, well, you got a very good training. This is the very first day that you start proving your patriotism, the loyalty to the emperor. We said, yes, sir. And at that moment, I saw the bluish white flask in the window. And then I had the sensation of flying up in the air and just floating around in the air. Apparently, obviously, uh, because of the powerful blast caused by the detonation of the atomic bomb. All the buildings were collapsing and my body was falling together with the collapsing building. When I regained my consciousness, I found myself in a total darkness and silence. I tried to move my body, but I couldn't. So I knew I was facing death. Then I started hearing faint voices of the girls around me. God help me. Mother help me. I am here. Then all of a sudden, strong male voice said by shaking my back, don't give up, don't give up, keep moving, keep pushing, keep kicking. You see the sunray coming through that opening. Move toward it, throw toward it as quickly as possible. And that's what I did and managed to come out of the burning rubble. It was already burning. That meant about 30 girls who were with me in the same room, were burnt to death alive. <coughs> Although it was the morning, it was a bright day, but by the time I came out of the rubble, it was dark, dark as twilight. As my eyes got adjusted to that darkness, I began to see 
some moving dark objects nearing me, and that was the procession of ghosts. I say ghosts because they didn't look like human beings. The people's hair was standing up toward the sky, just burned skin. The, the bodies were covered with blood and b blackened and swollen. And they were simply shuffling from the center part of the city to where we were. And some were carrying their own eyeballs in their hands. Part of the bodies were missing. And as they collapsed, their stomach burst open with intestines stretched out. Nobody was screaming or shouting. Nobody had that kind of physical and psychological strength. They simply existed and shuffled by. The soldier said, you girls, I and two other girls who managed to come out, you girls joined that procession and escaped to the nearby hillside. Now we have to learn to step over the dead bodies and dying people. And we got to the nearby army training ground, huge ground, about two football fields combined. By the time we got there, the place was packed with the dead bodies and dying people. And people were just groaning and moaning and whispering and begging for water, water. Nobody was screaming and running. It was like the city of death. We, we girls were injured relatively lightly, so we went to the nearby stream and washed off the blood and dirt from our bodies. And we tore off our blouses and soaked them in the cold water and dashed back to the dying people and put the wet cloth over the mouth of the injured and dying. And they just sucked in the moisture from those wet cloths. Just like that. I looked around and see if there were profession, healthcare professionals like doctors and nurses, but I couldn't see one single professional around. I learned later that about 80% of doctors and nurses were also killed, but the remaining 20% were serving somewhere else, not where I was. That meant in that huge military ground I escaped to, where how many thousands, how many tens of thousands, I don't know, they were all lying down without medication, any treatment or care, and just a few lucky ones got the wet cloth to suck the moisture from. That was the level of so-called rescue operation. When the darkness fell, we sat on the hill, and all night we watched the entire city burn, feeling stunned and numbed from the massive death and human suffering 
I had, I had witnessed. I said about 30 girls from my school were there with me, but the most of the girls, about 351 girls from my girls' school, were at the center part of the city, together with several thousand other grade seven and grade eight students, boys and girls from all the other high schools of the city. Uh, they were to provide manual labor for army. Just above them, or about 600 meters above them, the bomb was detonated. So they were there, some boys without a shirt, just a bare back on a hot summer morning, and they simply were incinerated and vaporized or carbonized. My sister-in-law was a teacher supervising the students. We looked for her body, but we never have found. On paper, she's still missing. My sister and her four-year-old child were walking over the bridge to go to the clinic, and they too were burned. The following day, I saw them. Uh, they were not, uh, they were unidentifiable. Just whole body were melted and swollen skin and um, flesh were hanging from their bones, and they too were whistling for water. They survived for several days. When they died, the soldiers came, dug up the hole in the ground, and poured the gasoline through the lit, lit match, and they kept turning the dead body, saying, Stomach is half burned, brain is not quite burned yet. Can you imagine? Thirteen year old girl just standing there without any feeling. Just watch that. I I had a very vivid memory of myself standing and watching that so called cremation of my dear sister and nephew. And that memory troubled me for many years. What kind of human being am I? My dear sister and her child being treated like roast pig or animals or insects. There was no human dignity associated with that cremation. Later on, when I went on to university, I did some study, especially psychological study, and see how human beings behave in the ultimate conditions. We just stop, we just, the, Im well, cognitively, uh, we were functioning, but we simply stopped feeling. The cessation of the emotion was uh, noted. Well, many testimonies have been written, and I have spoken with friends and so on, but we share the common experience. That's what happened to many people. Nobody could shed tears. The ex external stimuli was so massive, so grotesque, our psyche just closed off to prevent them to enter into our being. It was a good thing. If the stimuli kept affecting me, I couldn't have functioned in that horrible condition. 
Now, this, let me talk about my uncle and aunt. We heard that they survived that very first day. We rejoiced that. And they said, well, they are not injured. They have no cuts and bruises. People can see. But about a week or 10 days later, they started having purple spots all over their bodies. And that was a sure sign they were going to die. At that time, nobody knew what the nuclear weapon was all about. Nobody heard about, at least we didn't hear about radiation, radioactive poisoning affecting human body. You don't smell it, taste it, see it, but that goes deep into the bodies that affect the well-being, the health of human beings. And uh, that works in a very mysterious way. Some people uh, die almost instantly, and some people die a week later, a month later, a year later, some 10 years later. Very eerie, mysterious way, the effects of radiation were experienced by survivors. So you can imagine the anxiety and the fear people felt. In those days, first thing we did in the morning was, and before we got dressed, we had to check every part of our body, make sure there was no purple spot. Because if you see one, that was a sure sign. Well, <laughs> the loss of hair or the fever or diarrhea, bleeding, internal bleeding, bleeding from the gum. Well, all those symptoms were um, experienced. And I can't, well, I really can't go on giving all the detailed information. But one unique thing is uh, because of the, the heat of the fireballs which reached the ground level was about 4,000 degrees Celsius. I understand several hundred degrees Celsius melts iron, but it was 4,000 degrees. So many, many people who were on the streets were badly burned. And uh, all those scars turned out to be rather ugly. Layers and layers of um, anyway, those people just couldn't go outside to be seen by the public. They hid themselves. And uh, even without those visible scars, when people find out you were in the city at that time, people started avoiding them because they started hearing horrible stories like, there were some defective babies born from women who were pregnant, who were exposed to radiation. And something like a microcephalic with the babies with a small head, some of them were also born. So people feared the those of us who were in the city exposed to radiation are contaminate other healthy, normal people. So there was a serious issue of social discrimination, whether you had a tangible 
evidence or not of the experience in the bombing. I can go on giving that kind of detailed information, but let me add a few more. Go ahead, mm. yeah, a little bit more. Um, you see, this happened on, Hiroshima happened on August 6th. Three days later, August 9th, Nagasaki was attacked. And on the 15th of that month, Japan finally surrendered. And that meant Allied forces, occupation forces, landed on Japan for the end of that month. So early on in September, they are already working, controlling new territory. Emperor had to go, and General MacArthur took over the ruling of Japan. And General MacArthur said that he came to Japan with two specific goals. One is to demilitarize Japan. Secondly, to democratize Japan. Very good. And actually, he, his policies, some of the policies are very good, like a reform in the economic system, labor movement, and especially uh, for uh, the status of women. The woman got the vote. So that kind of social improvement did take place. But as far as Hiroshima and Nagasaki were concerned, I think he practiced totally opposite of what he claimed he came to Japan for. Uh, first of all, the research agency was established. It was called Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission. Sounds like medical research center. So people were very happy because they have been longing for medication. No, not, no medication available. So they expected some kind of help. And the medical experts with the new knowledge about this mysterious uh, symptoms people were suffering from. But soon we had to find out that agency, ABCC, was to study the effect of radiation of the atomic bomb to the human bodies. That was the sole purpose of the research, not to provide treatment to the dying people, agonizingly suffering people. Well, you can just imagine how survivors felt. They felt not just once, but twice treated as a guinea pig. Then media got the censorship from the Occupation Forces headquarters. If the local paper writes something about people's suffering caused by the atomic bomb, and uh, those companies publish such articles, had to be closed down for a certain period of time. Such things were not to be published. Not only that, the conf confiscation started taking place. Confiscation of diaries. People do keep their diaries. Or personal correspondences. Or some poems and haikus and so forth. And the Japanese love to write. When you are full of pain, somehow you ease your pain by expressing them in the form of poems and so on. 
all pictures, negatives, slides, films, anything which show human suffering due to the atomic bomb, those things had to be confiscated. I understand it was about 32,000 items in all. They were shipped back to the United States. So you can imagine, we, I just gave you a few examples, with those things happening around, and people quickly get the message, we are not supposed to talk about what we experienced. And people figured out, okay, it was all right for the paper to write about triumphant victory of the science and technology in producing that kind of weapon. But to write about unspeakable horror and suffering of human beings as a result of that is not to be known by the world. Well, this is the kind of oppressive, depressive environment in which people had to survive. Um, uh, let me jump. I finished university in Japan, and I had the opportunity to go to the United States to study social work, the profession which I chose because I witnessed such human suffering and so many selfless adults trying to, re to rebuild their lives, their families, and the communities, and giving everything they had in spite of the fact they lost everything, but they were not broken, they were not beaten, they wanted to rebuild. And Witnessing adults around me with this kind of spirit, I wanted to be a helping person, and I wanted to become a social worker. I needed a training, but I would quickly end. But when I went to the United States, it was the August of 1954. That spring, I think it was March 1st, the United States tested the largest hydrogen bomb at Bikini Atoll in Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. And that news really upset the entire Japan. People said, what? Not just Hiroshima, not only Nagasaki, now Bikini. Those people are suffering the same kind of symptoms as they all have experienced. This is a sure sign. United States is planning a nuclear war because testing is a prerequisite for the production in order to make develop the new weapon. You have to test it. So we knew the intent that the United States was preparing for something. Anyway, it's a long story, and within limited time to share it, it's difficult. But I just want to say, because of all this environmental circumstance, social, political, psychosocial environment, and after the end of the war, when people had more access to historical facts and the information. And people realized that instead of just pitting our fate, instead of just being bitter, and some people thought revenge, but no, we have more important thing to do. Our job is to act as a witness to the world. This is simply a beginning of nuclear age. 
This is the beginning of horrible things. And we have to speak out to the entire world. And this debate took place among the survivors over months and years. And it became a collective decision of survivors. I was still, I was still a teenager, but I watched adults struggling with the, this process of reaching their goal. So, making sure nobody in the world is going to experience the same thing as we did, that became the goal to prevent another Hiroshima and Nagasaki to happen. Well, I could go on all night, all day, all week, giving you the detail, but uh, how's the time Thank doing? You. Do I have time? <laughs> well, hopefully we'll have a lot more time. All right. Anyway, um, oh, let me say that. So I came to the United States, and I was interviewed by the press. And uh, I was asked what I thought about hydrogen bomb, hydrogen bomb test in the South Pacific, what I thought about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I honestly told the reporters what I thought. And the United States have to stop testing, have to stop producing more. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki was bad enough, but now bikini people are suffering. This is inhumane. This has to stop. And next day, I started getting unsigned hate letters at the university I was attending in the United States. I was faced with the decision to make. I just arrived. Now they are threatening me because I am not supporting American nuclear policy. Because I was honest to tell them what we experienced in Hiroshima Nagasaki. What do I do? Do I pretend and put a zipper over my mouth and keep silent? It was a traumatic experiment for me. I did the soul searching and I came out of that trauma with a stronger commitment and conviction that unless I speak out, unless I who have actually experienced it, who can? So that was my turning point to totally dedicate my life for this purpose. And I have been trying to do that. But it's been many years. It's been a struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Setsuko. Um, yeah, we have a little time for a little. We have a little time. Uh, would you like to use uh, your hearing aid to hear a little better? We have been traveling for three weeks. <coughs> I'm just going to let you finish.
Thank you very much, Tatsuko san, for that incredible testimony. I've heard it many, many times now, and every single time I learn something a little different. Um, we have been traveling together for, it feels like many months now, but it's only been three weeks. We've been to Paris, we've been to Barcelona, we went to the Pyrenees Mountains in Andorra, and now we're in this beautiful city that I, that is very dear to my heart, Madrid. Um, yeah, it's been quite quite a ride to to travel with you, and a very and a great learning experience. Um, are you looking at that picture in the in the background? Yeah, that's a nice picture of you. What what can you tell us about like the uh, that banner that is that that they are holding there? That picture was taken at the United Nations uh, when United Nations was hosting the conference on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Ah, okay. I think you were there too. I right? was, yes. Yeah, yes. And I was given the opportunity. I don't exactly remember what I said, but I must have shared my experience, my thought. I don't think I had the time to talk about the experience, but my thoughts, and very strongly uh, pushing for the adoption of the treaty to prohibit the nuclear, the use of and threat of use of nuclear weapons, yes. And I have spent many years uh, working for the purpose of nuclear disarmament. But um, when this was happening at the United Nations, I was really euphoric. I was really happy. Yeah. For many years, the world had not responded to our messages. They attempted or they justified American use of nuclear weapons or supported at least or come up with a nonsense such as, oh, well, our leaders know best, so they won't start another nuclear war. No, they know better. They will protect us which I suspected, but, um, but for many, many years, many decades, people certainly did not want to take the issue of nuclear weapons seriously. Maybe partly because it's such a horrendous topic, they just wanted to push out of their consciousness. They didn't want to think about it. They rather think about the parties and so forth. <laughs> but about 10 years ago, this kind of thing started happening. The millions of people from around the world, over 500 Organ citizens mm -hmm. groups around the world from over 100 nations came together, started working through the United Nations to pressure the government uh, to um, work on the treaty uh, to prohibit the nuclear weapon. Yeah, that was very exciting, wasn't it? That, that day? was yeah. really, yes. I had dreamt for it for many a days. Yes. And another exciting time was when we, when we, you know, I have this one, <laughs> when we won the, uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize, we actually brought it here to show you people. The, uh, thank you, Seth, he's another uh, friend of ours from ICANN. Uh, when we won this, this is the Nobel Medal when we got it back in, in 2017, in December. Um, after all of our efforts, uh, having all of those doors closed in our face, uh, we, we were able to get the treaty, and then we were able to 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 
we were bestowed upon that very prestigious award in which you gave such a brilliant uh, acceptance speech. That was very moving. 122 nations voted for it. And most of those 122 nations are smaller, militarily weak nations. But they all came together and said, enough is enough to the nuclear weapon arm state. You know, nine nations, starting with the United States and Russia and, you know, seven other nations who have the nuclear weapons. They have been exerting their pressure at the United Nations. Mm. The little guys didn't have much power. But at this conference, majority of the world's uh, nations came and said, enough is enough. We want to have a say. And so this is a tremendous positive first step toward the goal of eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. It's just a prohibition at the moment, but step by step, we have to move toward the total elimination of nuclear weapons. That's our goal, and it should be the goal of all of us here. I hope you join us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now let's see, we've, we've apparently over exceeded our time, which is great because you were fantastic. But let's see if anybody has any questions from the audience. Uh, si, por favor. Ah, wait, let's. Yosuko, thank you very much for being in Madrid and for give this wonderful conference. It's for me a, a dream to see you here. And I would like to let you know that I was in Hiroshima. I was in, in Japan uh, like three months ago, and I went to the Zona Zero, to the building, the only building that is in Hiroshima from that day. Uh, I can tell you, I felt a lot the energy that is uh, still in that place. And for me, it was very sad. It's still very sad um, to listen to you and to know how you felt that day. And for me, uh, I was surprised because I saw that in the building, uh, there is uh, like some words that say that some people in Japan wanted that uh, this building stay in the city and some other people didn't want to be there, that building. And finally, they keep, they keep the, the place and the building. Why they decide to keep that building, the only one that is in Hiroshima from the war? Why finally did you decide to keep it there? Thank you very much. You're talking about dome. Yeah, the dome. Domes, eh? yeah. Well, we all felt that, although painful, we should never forget what we experienced. That should be the lesson for the all of humanity. We have to keep talking about it. So. That is a symbolic reminder of that fate. But it's a hopeful symbol that because we should never repeat that, humanity should never repeat that, then we remind ourselves each day that mm -hmm. the conflict must be resolved in a different way, not by killing, melting each other. M melting masses of human beings. Can you just visualize that? 4,000 degrees 
Celsius, melting human skins and flesh. That's what happened. That's unimaginable, I think. But that was a tiny baby nuclear weapon. Today, we're talking about hydrogen bomb, which a um, thousand times more destructive. So we're talking about a different scale of the bomb. So the whole discussion of nuclear weapon is really insanity to me. Yeah, but true. some leaders seem to think it's OK. We can use the taxpayers' money to make more of them so that we can be safe from the enemy. That's what they seem to believe. To, from my mouth, I can never support that. That's nonsense. It's an illusion and delusion. That's my belief. Yes, thank you. And it's, it's a very big sum. It's $116 billion a year that are invested of public funds on the maintenance of nuclear weapons. 116 mil millones de dólares al año se invierten. So, 160 billion dollars are invested every year to um, do the maintenance uh, and, and keep those nuclear weapons. Have we got any other question here? Spain has not supported the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Have you had the chance to to contact? Uh, well, you have the chance to contact many people here. So I would like to know uh, what's the uh, the response you have found amongst uh, Spaniards uh, about this topic. Well, it's been uh, uh, quite uh, exciting. Uh, we have uh, several uh, friends in civil society here that are moving the, the topic around. When we went to Barcelona, for example, we met with Ada Colau. The meeting was excellent. And the city of Barcelona is uh, supporting the treaty already. We have a municipal campaign uh, that goes around uh, different cities of the world. Uh, Barcelona is supporting us already. It was quite uh, exciting. But uh, not just that, but also the commitment of the city council. We have had several meetings with different uh, communities and the press and I think the the idea has been very well very welcomed. We have also met with uh, government representatives in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and we have been talking about technical aspects around around uh, being a part of the NATO and and why that has uh, um, a political influence on the position of Spain around nuclear weapons. The truth is Spain as a country has never supported any of the political steps that has uh, brought us to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, despite the fact that in the referendum in 1986 to be part of NATO, Spain um, mentioned as a condition the prohibition of nuclear weapons and According to our own analysis, NATO has no commitment. It, it, it shouldn't be a, a legal issue for Spani Spain to, uh, to um, uh, support the treaty. Before coming here, we uh, had a meeting in the Congress with several uh, members of parliament from different political parties, and they were very open to uh, supporting the prohibition. So it's been an excellent step, uh, very exciting. Uh, and the idea has been uh, welcomed here, and uh, we hope the Spanish people is uh, also able to uh, to put pressure on the government to to support uh, the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So what uh, Setsuka just mentioned uh, uh, never happens uh, the higher at a bigger scale. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my question is for Setsuko. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say that it, it has been a privilege to hear your story. And my question is, uh, after what happened in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
how do you deal personally with the pain and the sorrow and with the forgiveness? And uh, would, which advice would you give to the young generations? Thank you. Well, this is a very difficult question you raised. Um, touchy question, shall I say, or something I find it extremely difficult. If I understand correctly, that having experienced the bombing, how have I dealt with my pain and so forth. And forgiveness, that was the words used to. I know I became a Christian, so forgiveness should be part of my vocabulary, yes. And uh, some people say, well, it happened so long ago. Well, you must have forgiven Americans and so forth. The word forgiveness is used so lightly to me I'm still struggling with that forgiveness. Yes, Jesus said, if somebody hits you on the left, the turn right. And that kind of thing was a real puzzle to me before I became Christian. But anyway, that is the very difficult. Now, you see, what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? It's not something which happened and that evil was wiped, like European Holocaust. Terrible thing happened, but that was, that ended. That's not continuing. But with the issue of nuclear weapon, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for the past 75 years, that evil has been continually happening and intensifying more, when you think of that reality, how do you negotiate with sense of forgiveness? Somebody who started that evil has no remorse and continue on building and threatening the world and others have to keep up with that evil power? Well, if you have the easy answer, give it to me. I'm still struggling. Thank you, Tatsuko. Uh, uh, over here. Yo quiero preguntar, eh... I would like to ask, we were invited to it. What what can we do as citizens to to join you in this fight for the prohibition of nuclear weapons? Thank you. Bueno, eh... Well, this we just have to keep the conversation alive. We need uh, to the uh, legitimize. Nuclear weapons, and we not need to be to make sure our government supports the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So, what can we do? We have several tools at hand. We have uh, that uh, commitment from uh, the parliament. We can ask uh, uh, members of parliament to support the prohibition of nuclear weapons. We can also ask and, and demand our, our city governments, our city councils and town councils to support um, uh, the prohibition and those campaigns are in the ICANN website but we can also de-invest our own funds. This uh, campaign that's called Don, Don, uh, Bank on the Bomb, it's a campaign in which you can also ask your, your town councils to make an, uh, a responsible investment in nuclear weapons and your own investment as well, making sure that, I mean, maybe young people don't have a pension fund, but those who already have a pension have and those who are worried about those, that kind of thing, 
we should uh, think that our, our money, uh, make sure that our money has nothing to do with nuclear weapons. And also, you know, just keep the conversation alive. Yesterday, in, in the event at the uh, Complutense University of Madrid here, we were talking about all the activity in the media we have had this week, and we need to, to expand the, and, and the, the message. And if you um, use the hashtag, uh, no to nuclear weapons, or something like that, that's a great way of keeping the uh, conversation alive, making sure that this topic is something that that's mentioned everywhere. So people talk about it in, in bars, in, in cafeterias, in restaurants, everywhere. It's something that uh, we, we, we truly need people to know about the topic and have a conversation about it and put pressure on the government. So irrespective of the political pressures they might be receiving, they're able to make the right decision because, I mean, we all have political pressures. Latin America had tons of uh, pressure um, uh, not to enter the the treaty on the prohibition uh, coming from the U.S. and and African countries that had the pressure coming from France, but things were done despite these uh, political pressures because people were pressuring on governments as well. So let's keep that uh, topic alive. That's the most important thing we can do. Hashtag no nuclear weapons. Good afternoon. Well. Many countries have um, have uh, passed and, and and support something that's positive, but I'm worried, and because you know, biggest and and more, uh, strongest countries can just uh, hold um, the rest of the world hostage, and, and and they keep on investing. Biggest countries: China, Pakistan, India, Russia, and, and the, the uh, big giant, the U.S. They keep on investing on it. So I feel very pessimistic because there are many countries that support the the idea. And you know, all, you know, but and good people support the idea of living in peace. But I don't see it's going to be something effective because then they are really um, we really are at the mercy of these countries I uh, just mentioned. I will answer this question. And, but I mean resistance and and acceptance. But when we um, started talking about this treaty, um, well, we're talking about a very few years. In 2013, they were laughing at us in our faces. I mean, we we counted the, um, um, the amount of times that prohibition was mentioned because nobody dared uh, saying I'm I'm going to prohibit this. The, the, you 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 know say they would not use prohibition. In the United Nations, and now we are in another phase, which is resisting. It's a phase in which you know the response against uh, uh, the majority of of uh, of uh, you know the, the nations. You know the fact that uh, France is talking about uh, you know uh, the situation of France in the in the. European Union and Trump saying no, this agreement uh, is not useful. That's part of of keeping. That's part of the answer, the response uh, against something that's happening. Because if we think about how nuclear weapons work, in 1998, for example, India, when they carry out their their three tests, they said we did this because we had to show the world we are. Uh, we had, uh, we had, we were, we had guts. So, this whole idea of power comes from the, and that's what we have to to get rid of. So, right now, of course, we are seeing this this resistance from these big powers, and what that means is that we are going forward. And you're saying that you feel pessimistic, but I, I'm I'm a, I'm I'm an an optimist and realistic at the same time because optimism it's not it's it doesn't mean you're not realistic because the only people really who change the world are those who believe that change is possible right so optimism is in truth um, realism because it's it's our engine it's the fuel of civil society and we we don't have any more time. I see you're quite interested, and it makes me very happy. 
it has been a, a great experience to be able to be here with you and I want to thank you for your attention thank you Setsuko thank you Carlos thank you for for your task for your work which is uh, humane and it's a, it's a great task and thank you for putting in the um, you know a topic uh, on the table again from in the Talos community we accept the and the fact that we have to keep on thinking about it from the Telos community we accept and uh, and the challenge of uh, uh, putting this topic back uh, in our debate and our conversation and and using your words as inspiration and would like all of the Telos foundation all of the Telos community and the telephony foundation to give a huge hand to Setsuko Thurlow and Carlos Amaña thank you